Welcome to episode 89 of Scouting Hot Finds Radio. My name is Jason Spangler, the Santee Swapper, your host. Well, guys, this is the first episode that you've heard in a long time. It has literally been over a year since I've published an episode of Scouting Hot Finds Radio, my podcast for the Scout Patch Collectors community. You know, if you're just listening to this for the first time, let me just share that uh, this is really uh, a podcast that started in October of 2011. And today's episode is episode 89 of the podcast. But as you'll see, we've had a few gaps in there. Uh, If you don't know me, you're not familiar, let me just share that I've been publishing an email newsletter for over a decade. It's called the Scouting Hot Finds. And you can subscribe to that email and see the archived issues on my website at scoutpatchcollectors.com. Now, what we do in the Hot Finds newsletter is we highlight interesting auctions on eBay in the Boy Scout category. And I generally just kind of use it as a blog and talk about my life as a scouting memorabilia dealer and also someone who's very active in scouts as a unit leader, uh, the dad of a uh, we blow uh, scouts, BSA female, and also in the summer times as a camp director. And uh, so I just sort of treat it that way. If you want to catch up on some previous episodes of the Scouting Hot Finds Radio, you can do that really on any podcast player. For example, if you have an iPhone, there's a podcast app on any Apple device. Also on Spotify, iHeartRadio, etc. All of those will be places where you can go back and listen to older episodes of Scouting Hot Finds Radio. So today we have the first episode in over a year, and I want to let you know we're really going to have three topics that we're going to cover in this first episode coming back. I've titled the name of this episode Roots, and in each of these three topic areas, I think that I can make a connection back to that title. That'll some kind of makes somehow make sense. The first of these three topics is kind of where I'm going with Scouting Hot Finds Radio. What is the plan moving forward? Then I want to tell you about something new that I'm creating called the Scouting Hot Finds Insiders. And then finally, in this podcast, you're actually going to hear an audio interview with me from 2006 from the old Cloth Talk podcast. I'll speak more about that in a few minutes. So let me start off with Roots. In other words, how am I going to put down roots for a better 2021 with this podcast and other things in the uh, scouting collectors community? Well, the numbers aren't very good, gang. I've only published four episodes in the last two years. This is what people generally call pod fade, where your podcast just kind of fades out. And some of you might have experienced this. I actually experienced this recently. One of my favorite podcasts is called E-Commerce Momentum. A guy named Steven Peterson publishes that. And when the pandemic came on, he went from a weekly schedule to just nothing. It was a pod fade. He just disappeared. I even reached out to friends of his on Facebook to see if he was okay. But uh, turns out things were fine. He just had a lot of stuff come up in life and with his business. And he eventually has returned back to podcasting, which I was so thankful for. Um, <laughs> I really was wondering what happened. No, come back. I don't know that any of you have been shedding any tears that I have not been podcasting uh, in quite a while, but I am trying to lay down some roots to figure out how can I bring this podcast back. Now, in the last year, I did record an interview with Doug Schwab. That was all the way back in February, guys. I procrastinated on editing the audio, and then I got caught up in moving my warehouse in March. And then, as we all know, COVID lockdowns started happening in March. And so for one reason or another, this was a project that I just never picked back up. I think I knew that I didn't have the time or energy to flip the switch back on and really fire this back up. And uh, so I just let it languish for the entire year. I didn't publish any new podcasts for Scouting Hot Finds Radio. Then finally, one day I was sitting at a table uh, on my laptop coming up with something to say in my Scouting Hot Finds newsletter. Uh, You know, that's kind of actually how it works, guys. Uh, Every newsletter, I don't really go in with a map of what I'm going to say. It's kind of just inspiration, what hits me for what kind of becomes that blog topic in the newsletter. And what I decided was, you know what? I need some help. You know, guys, when you get older, you hire people to help you with things that maybe sometimes uh, you can't do for yourself because you don't have the knowledge or you physically can't do it anymore. Or also when you get older, maybe you just don't want to because it's a pain in the butt. Let me give you examples, uh, lawn service, for example, or, or house cleaning. 
both of which I actually pay someone to do. I, I, I cut my own grass. Let me say that. Uh, when we moved into our new house, it had a beautiful green lush lawn. And so I hired a lawn service to come and put out the fertilizer and the weed killers and all those things. They'd come up about five or six times a year to help me keep that keep that grass clean. And then I just have to admit, house cleaning is just a guilty pleasure. Once a month, we have this wonderful, wonderful lady who comes and deep cleans our house. And it's just so wonderful. <laughs> My wife appreciates it. I appreciate it. The kids appreciate it. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you just have to hire someone. You just have to get some help in order to do things that you could do yourself, but you otherwise just won't or, or can't do it. And so what I really needed was this. I needed to find someone who would take that raw audio, who would listen to it with really a fine tooth comb to eliminate the gaps, the the garbled words, the time we unconsciously, um, if you've ever recorded yourself, you'll know that almost all of us do this. We fill in dead space with noises. We restart sentences. And uh, it's just not very good to listen to when you're trying to be a podcast person. You want to want clean audio. Also, maybe someone to add some bumper music and really just increase the overall quality of the show. So I reached out to the Scouting Hot Finds community and within 24 hours, I heard back from Samuel, who's the son of one of my subscribers. Now, we've bounced ideas back and forth for a few weeks, and we sort of had a trial run editing that audio from my interview with Doug, and it turned out to be a great clean audio file. Uh, Samuel really did a good job. Then to take it a step further, I sent him some raw footage of an unboxing video that I need to get published. This one was really choppy because I didn't turn my phone on airplane mode and I used my iPhone to record the video. And so I think I literally got three phone calls during that recording, each of which kind of knocked off the video and I had to start back over or start from where I left off. But Samuel, he, man, he pulled it all together uh, to create really a, a, a good unboxing video. And since then, he's coached me up on how I can add some more camera angles to, again, just raise the quality of the finished product. Uh, so now with my two-person team now assembled, I'm ready to bring back the Scouting Hot Finds podcast in 2021 on a bi-weekly schedule. I have already have a few people lined up for interviews, and I will have the Doug Schwab interview published on January 11th. From then, it should be every two weeks for new episodes. I hope that listeners will find value in having a more polished and more frequent podcast for our hobby. Over the 88 episodes, I've interviewed some really interesting people in the hobby, uh, sadly, including at least three who are no longer with us. And so going forward, I want to capture more of the people that are helping to keep the hobby going and shine a light on this great scouting collecting community. Uh, the second topic I wanted to hit in today's podcast was this New thing I'm doing, I'm calling it Scouting Hot Vines Insiders. The way that I look at this as roots, as laying down roots, is I'm really trying to build a model that is sustainable. Here's the thing about doing all these fun projects. They cost a lot of money. <laughs> um, I know these are choices that I make, so I'm not here to complain. But if you'll forgive me, I'll just share some expenses with you just to kind of paint the picture. All right. So here's the thing. It cost me... $1,500 a year to maintain my account with Constant Contact to publish the Scouting Hot Finds newsletter to over 5,000 readers. My podcast hosting with a company called Spreaker is right at $199 a year, and I roughly pay about $168 a year for web hosting with GoDaddy. In fact, just last month, I renewed all of my stuff with them for multiple years to get a discount, and it cost me $1,188. If we just break it down, it's roughly about $163 a month without actually publishing any new content. That's just to keep everything turned on, to record interviews, to write newsletters, to record a video. All of that just cost me time and effort. But the $163 a month, that's actual money that I have to pay every month to keep these running. So in order to really bring back the podcast, I'm going to hire Samuel and pay him a respectable fee for editing the audio. It works out that each episode is going to cost between $75 to $100 in order to get that polished, finished product back. And that's a lot of money for a penny-pinching, thrifty, patch collector like me. 
But at the same time, I realize that without this service, the podcast is dead. I mean, you could probably go back to episodes that I've done in the last couple of years. And most likely in in all of those episodes, I probably had some statement about I'm going to be bringing the podcast back and you're going to hear from me more often and other empty promises. But the truth is, it was a project that I got excited about. And maybe I was willing to spend four or five or six hours on one day getting it all ready. But I've taken on a lot of responsibilities over the last couple, three years with becoming a camp director, uh, really, really growing my business, and then lots of other things with life. And so the podcast is just something that's just not sustainable unless I hire Samuel and really get some help. So how would this work? And talking to one of my good friends, Paul Gowder, go check him out at powwows.com. He's been a friend since we were in Scouts, you know, 30 plus years ago. I was in his wedding. He was in my wedding. can tell you lots of good, funny stories about Paul and I. But Paul has been kind of a mentor, too, for me. He's been in this website thing since uh, the late 90s. I think 1996 is when he launched his website. And so I kind of talked to him about this problem. I got the idea that if I wanted to bring the podcast back, the model that people are using these days is to ask the audience to support content creators through a platform called Patreon. Now, if you've listened to podcasts, if you've watched YouTube videos or maybe for some of you younger types out there, TikTok videos, then perhaps you've heard of Patreon. It's a service that allows you to tip, if you will, the creator on a monthly basis to thank them for putting in the time and effort and money to create new content that you enjoy. But it also has a layer when you can unlock bonus content that is not on any other platform. And that's what I really decided to do with my new Patreon community that I'm calling the Scouting Hot Finds Insiders. I'm saying, hey, if you've been reading my newsletter, which I know some of you have been reading it for years because I've emailed back and forth with you over the last decade that I've been publishing it. Uh, Some of you have been watching my unboxing videos on YouTube or some of you listening to this podcast right here. uh, Then you would consider perhaps helping me pay for all of this. This is certainly not a way to make money off of my subscribers, but rather I see it as a way to say, hey, if everyone chipped in a few bucks per month, then I can bring back the podcast. I can make better videos. I can increase the quality and the frequency of content that I think serves the hobby. So let me kind of explain what these levels are and how this would work. As I described, Patreon is based on the idea of sort of a monthly subscription level. And what this money would do would be, again, to help me pay for all of these things, for the hosting and the, especially the, the editing of the audio for Scouting Hot Finds Radio, but then also maybe even some videos. So what you would do, you'd go to this website, www.patreon.com forward slash Scouting Hot Finds Insiders. I'll have a link for that on all of my social media stuff so you don't have to write it down. You can easily find a link. If you click on that link, you'll go to my page and you can see that I've set things up where I have really five different levels that you could join at. Let me kind of give you the rundown of those real quick on the air. Uh, The first of those I just simply said is a friend of Scouting Hot Finds and that is uh, $2 a month. That is sort of the idea of a tipping jar. You would just tip uh, the Hot Finds $2 per month And there is, of course, a benefit. I tried to include benefits at each level. And so this benefit is you'll get a 15% off coupon code, an exclusive discount on any items I have for sale on my Shopify store at scoutpatchhq.com. So that is just basically, I'm willing to give you $2 a month. I enjoy listening to your stuff. Carry on. The next level is called a Scouting Hot Finds Backer. And that is $5 per month. Of course, you'll also get that exclusive discount coupon, but also this is what I think people would kind of maybe be interested in an exclusive podcast piece called after the interview. And for each of my future interviews, I'm going to record a little bonus content with that person. And that will only be available to people who are backers in my scouting hot finds, Patreon group, the insiders. The next level is $10 a month. This is the the namesake. This is called Scouting Hot Finds Insider. If you were to join at this level, you will get that discount. You'll also get the after the interview. 
But I also have another piece of new exclusive content that I'm going to share with those people. And it's called After the Unboxing. Really the most interesting thing I do on YouTube is my unboxing videos. And so in this After the Unboxing series that will only be available to people at this level, you will be able to see sort of an extra video that I will film after the unboxing. I'll talk about really kind of the real value and quality of the items that I get. You know, if the unboxings are kind of meant for the public. They're kind of meant for everybody, mom, pop, you know, kids that are in scouts. But that after the unboxing video is going to be kind of a little bit more of like, what do I really think of the collection? What's really good in here? Maybe what have I researched? What in here is a surprise item for me that I think is really cool? So you'll get one of those videos every month at that level. And then I have two more levels I want to tell you about. The next one is called Scouting Hot Finds, the Threadheads. And so this one, I will include all of those things, of course. The bonus that you will get here is you will also get another exclusive video called Inside the Warehouse. In these videos, I will share tips and tricks on how I run my eBay business with really a behind the scenes look at my warehouse, kind of showing you how I've been able to build up this business and things you might find interesting. And then also we're going to have an exclusive Threadhead Zoom one time a month where you'll be connected with myself and maybe some other collectors and we'll just kind of bring back that Threadhead show together, uh, talk about patches, ask questions, maybe have a topic that we're focused on for that day. And so you kind of have the opportunity, if you want to, to actually be a part of that content creation. Again, that's the Threadhead level. And then, you know, in talking to my friend Paul, he said, honestly, he said, you need to have one level that's kind of like the super premium. He said, there's going to be somebody in, in your community that's really going to be willing to really support you, help pay for these things. And what they really want is they want some exclusive access to you. They would be sort of a super fan, if you will. And so what I've done is the, the highest level is called a Scouting Hot Finds patron, and that is $50 per month. What you would get is all of the other bonuses I've already mentioned, but then the added pieces would be you would have access to me one-on-one uh, with phone call to answer questions or talk shop or whatever, uh, sort of be your, your patch consultant, if you will. And then this might be the thing that I think I thought would be really cool was an annual three-hour warehouse tour and picking to be scheduled at a time that is convenient for both of us and lunch is on me. So I have a warehouse. It's a 2,000-square-foot warehouse outside of Charlotte. And I've talked to a few people who've just said, you know, I'd love to come and see what you've got and go through the boxes and, you know, maybe buy some stuff or just, you know, spend the afternoon with you. And so what I've decided to do is kind of wrap that in a bundle and say, here it is. If you are willing to be a Scouting Hot Finds patron, then I will open the door to you. We'll schedule that once a year. You know, hopefully COVID will be over soon and that will happen. Um, So that is the highest level of this group. So again, just in reviewing the Scouting Hot Finds Insider, the idea here is that I'm trying to build a sustainable model where I can actually afford to hire Samuel and pay for the help that I need to give you the content that so many of you have been looking for and I have been short on. The third and final part of today's podcast is going to be focused on cloth talk. Now, for those of you who have been around for a little while, you will remember that cloth talk was the really the first podcast in our scout memorabilia collecting hobby. It was back in 2006, 2007. The guys on there, Tim, Ben, Chris Brightwell, who I'm still in communication with. This is maybe even the first podcast I'd ever listened to. And there's multiple, multiple episodes that they did during that time span. These guys were from Alabama originally, Coosa Lodge. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Cloth Talk because I've actually got Chris uh, Brightwell agreed to come on and do a separate podcast interview with me talking about podcasts and some of the other things that he's got going on, Cloth Talk especially. But the reason why I bring this up is about 15 years ago, I was on episode five. Episode five was focused on the topic of eBay, and I was interviewed by Tim and Ben for about 20 minutes. Uh, At the time, the focus of my efforts online, this was before Hot Finds Newsletter, before all that good stuff, uh, was a website that I call patchblanket.com. This was a bulletin board, if you can remember those, some of you who've been around a little while. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, just kind of imagine the idea of a Facebook group. It was kind of the, uh, like a Facebook group. But at the time of this interview, it's kind of ironic. I went and did a little research today on it. 
Facebook opened itself up to everyone on September 26 of 2006. Before that, it had kind of been limited to universities and then later expanded out to maybe some businesses and such. But about 2006 in September was when it opened up to everyone. That's honestly a about the same time period that I recorded this interview with these guys talking about my website patch blanket. And so it's so fascinating. It's kind of a time capsule for our hobby of what things looked like prior to Facebook. Another little interesting quote that uh, just to kind of give you a a landmark here is in this interview, I mentioned that there's 10,000 items in the Boy Scout category. Guys, today there's over 400,000 items in the Boy Scout category at eBay. That's 40x bigger. Holy cow. And so this is kind of a time capsule. So as I talk about my theme being roots today, this interview is kind of my route to where I started almost 15 years ago to find my voice in the hobby and to try to bring together a community of scouters that were passionate about collecting. Uh, So eventually, you know, this is going to lead to the Scouting Hot Finds newsletter and Scout Petroler's Facebook group, other things like that. But this was kind of the roots of it, this this patch blanket idea I had, and this interview with the guys from Cloth Talk sort of captures that. So I hope you enjoy this rebroadcast, if you will, of that 20-minute interview, and then stay around for the uh, tail end, and I will sign off. Well, being online with us right now is Jason Spangler. Jason is a former Lodge Chief of uh, Santee Lodge and is the webmaster of uh, www.patchblanket.com. He's also a former Section Chief of the Dixie Fellowship. Uh, Jason, uh, welcome to Cloth Talk. Thanks a lot. I'm really glad to be here and support what you guys are doing, breaking some new ground for the hobby with your podcast. Well, thanks. Uh, I know that uh, uh, I look at uh, Patch Blanket a lot. It's got a lot of interesting um, statistics and all on there from eBay and and I mean it's just stunning to me to look and see the amount of money that flows through eBay on the Scout collectible side of the house and and uh, I know that's one thing that you track maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about that sure uh, patch blanket got started about four months ago and uh, basically what it is it's a website it's a discussion board where people post um, information and everyone who goes and visits the site can see and what we try to do on Patch Blanket is try to treat eBay as a news event. Um, you know, in our hobby today, eBay is kind of the, the thing that's happening where a lot of patches are being sold. Um, a lot of people are, you know, talking about the big auctions that took off and patches that sold for $70,000. And those are the things that I want to read about. You know, if I go on the internet and I click on Yahoo News or go to some website to click on news. What I really want to know is I want to know what's happening on eBay. And that's where Patch Blanket comes in. What we try to do is treat uh, eBay as kind of our our news and and go in there and dig up uh, the neat auctions that are happening. Um, We also try to use eBay marketplace research to find out um, how much things are selling for in the categories. um, So it's just kind of a fun thing. Trying to, another way to look at the hobby, I guess you'd say. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's a uh, fascinating fascinating data that, that I see uh, go across uh, go across uh, patch blanket with. Uh, I mean everything. I think uh, on the top right here, uh, dated. I'm, I'm looking at this. Let's see. It says uh, auction price. Let's see. Sold auctions uh, th- uh, three thousand one hundred sixty two. Total auction sales thirty six thousand dollars. <laughs> I mean, it, it is uh, impressive what you uh, and the way you analyze it. it, it good. It, uh, yeah, the good description. You treat it like a news event. Jason, where, you just, your site here has like all this information. How do you like gather all this information? It seems like it would be like a uh, tedious task to get all this together, where is, or is there like a place where it sort of all pulled together for you already? Well, Ben, uh, you know, I used to read on uh, in the ISCA Journal and other places where people like Roy Moore, for example, would do some analysis of eBay, and I used to wonder, man, how did he know that? You know, he would tell you how many millions of dollars sold in this year and all that sort of thing, and I was always anxious to read what he had to say. Um, and then about four or five months ago, I got an email from eBay actually detailing a new service that they offer called Marketplace Research. And for a subscription fee, 
they allow you to go in and do some really sophisticated analysis of completed items. Um, so I signed up for the full, you know, silver membership, and um, what it allows me to do is go into the Boy Scout category and just sort it all out according to, like, how many items sold, what the average bid was, and um, just every kind of analysis you'd want to do. And this really is available to anyone. Um, it's not even that expensive. It's a monthly fee. But what I decided to do was to, when I got that and saw what a neat thing it was, I decided to create a website that would kind of wrap itself around that information. Um, and so my posts on the side are usually just sort of statistical, hey, did you see this, and this is what things are selling for. And what I hope other people will do is kind of be the, the reporters, if you will, the ones who are watching the bizarre auctions or see something unbelievable come up, and they'll post so that the rest of us can, can find it. Because I don't know about anyone listening, but I don't have time to search every auction and find every little bizarre thing that's on ebay so i trust other people to send me emails and tell me about it yeah yeah that's really cool it's it's amazing that i mean we we touched on this i think even in our very first cloth stock episode just the way ebay has changed everything it's amazing that even in the span of of how long ebay has been a part of patch collecting how much things have changed over that amount of time are, are there like with as much in depth as, as you see ebay are there any trends or any sort of like changes occurring even now that you've noticed since the time that you've been really looking closely at everything? It's, it's interesting if you talk to someone uh, like, say, Chris Jensen, who's been sort of the traditional patch dealer, you know, through the years. Um, I think that eBay has kind of changed how the hobby w really operates in that sense. Um, give an example. I, I spoke to Chris this week, actually, and um, he said, you know, that 99% of the people that he competes against on eBay as far as selling, they don't have any overhead. You know, they, they're just hobbyists. They don't have a warehouse to rent and employees to pay and all these sort of things. Right. And so it kind of put a, a, a stress on the traditional dealers, and uh, it's allowed a lot of people who are just hobbyists to sort of, you know, instantly become, I don't know, many patch dealers. Uh, so it's kind of democratized the, uh, the hobby in some ways. But um, I think what's beginning to happen now is that there's just so many items in the Boy Scout category on eBay that the prices seem to be coming down on a lot of things. Um, you know, I've, Chris has told me before, Chris Jensen, that uh, he used to be he could sell a 64 Jamboree patch for 50 or $60 when it first came out, when eBay really first hit. Um, but now you see that the things that are truly common, like old Jamboree patches, really just don't bring any money at all. So um, if it, there's been any trend, I would say that generally um, the laws of supply and demand have kind of kicked in. And uh, where you see things that are common, you know, they're bringing very, very low prices. And it's only the rare things or the things that are really hot um, that are really, you know, bringing the high, the high bids anymore. Right, right. I think I think maybe even I've in, in my short time as a patch collector and trader, I've seen some of those effects of like things coming down in value. I mean, I remember uh, in my old lodge, uh, like I remember what patches used to go for. You know, only even like three or four years ago, and it seems like I mean it's a merged lodge now, but but it seems like now even those patches that that I would think would go for you know thirty forty dollars something like that now they're you know in the in the fifteen to to twenty dollars range so, so that's really interesting yeah i think you know and i can remember i haven't been in the hobby that long um but i can remember getting sales lists and auction lists from people like um uh, morley and topkiss out in california or roy moore and those people and you know really when, during that time maybe the hobby 10 15 years ago you had sort of a small group of people that had the reach to send out a sales list, you know, to thousands of people. And so they were able to really get probably, you know, good money for the items they had because they were sort of in control of the distribution. And, you know, obviously people can't afford to drive all over the country and go to all the traderies that these guys go to. But now, you know, you, you never have to go to a tradery ever. You just sit in your own, you know, uh, bedroom and, and, and put together a, a killer collection if you're willing to, you know, fork out the money. So... 
Um, yeah. It's interesting how the hobby has changed. Largely, I mean, it, to, to to maybe the older collectors, they, they see the sort of maybe trend downward in prices is like maybe bad news, but I think it's also can be interpreted as good, good news for the new collectors. I mean, uh, you know, if you already have the patch, you want it to be valuable, but for the for the newcomers and the new scouts, the, the ordeal members in OA or, or like the, you know, tenderfoot scouts and scouting, um, you know, it gives them a chance to get some of those patches that maybe would have been a little more out of their reach uh, than they were in the past. So um, it's just, a, it's all another tale of the evolving of our hobby and the way it's changing over time and, and everything. So, uh, you know, good and bad, come, both come with it. So, Yeah, and I would be very curious, this is something you could probably never find out, but I'd be curious to know what the ages are of the people on eBay. You know, I've, I don't I don't usually seem to sell items, and I do sell quite a bit on eBay. It doesn't seem like I ever sell items to kids, like you're saying, you know, where the mm-hmm. price is really low. I mean, I do think I sell to some parents, and every once in a while I have a mother who says this is a, you know, eagle present or that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, I wish I wish there was a way to know exactly who are these thousands of people that are, you know, bidding. Are they just mom and pops? Are they serious collectors or, you know, little kids? I don't know. It's but it's yeah. neat to, to look at it. Yeah, a couple couple of things, uh, Jason. I wanted to ask. That would be interesting to know that demographic data. Do you see any s- seasonal swings? Like, uh, do you, do you see prices uh, maybe higher during the winter time when people don't have as much to do, but maybe be inside and look at eBay as opposed to during the summer? Well, that's one of the neat things that I've been able to do with Patch Blanket is that the the data that you can get from eBay does show you week by week what's happening. And of course, there are some some dips, like say around uh, Christmas holidays, for example, where you would really expect that. Um, But ironically, there's really a lot of um, consistency. Um, If you look at, for example, like in a category like OA, for example, and you look at how many items were sold per week, um, I can't tell you right this second without digging into the website what it is, but it seems to hold pretty steady. There will be some highs and lows. Um, The one thing I would say is really seasonal is when you have a big national event, uh, like the Jamboree. Um, I'm really looking forward to the NOAC this year, not so much um, the fact that it's going or anything, but just watching what happens on eBay with the NOAC. Um, last last NOAC, I can remember there were literally airmen in their dorm rooms hooking up to the university system and selling patches, you know, live from the NOAC uh, running auctions. Well, you're, and, uh, yeah, you're, you're talking to a few. <laughs> no, but we were, we were actually looking at eBay. I don't think we sold anything, but yeah, okay, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it, that was amazing. And, and so there's, there's this wave, uh, you know, not quite a tidal wave, but there's this wave of stuff that comes out after a big event and, and the prices seem to really surf pretty, pretty high for a while. Uh, but then with this last NOAC, you know, about a month afterwards, um, everything just seemed to tumble back down to uh, uh, what you'd expect, you know, patches selling for $5 each instead of 20 and and that sort of thing. So I'll be really interested to see what happens with this NOAC, if, if it rides itself out or if it, it kind of plays out real quickly in just a few weeks after the event's over, things are... You know, back to normal. Yeah, that'll be that will be interesting. So, uh, a couple other things I wanted to ask, just from your experience, sure. what's the most expensive thing you've seen sold on eBay, or the strangest thing, well, unique, I guess. Well, one of the funny things we we do on the website is we have something called the Big Jim Award, and uh, this is one of our members named Jim, and uh, I guess he's a thrifty scout because he sort of scowls at people who think that their stuff is is made of gold and they want to sell it for thousands of dollars. Um, and so, what we've done on the website is we've created this link where you can post auctions on there where people have attempted to sell something for a ridiculous amount and of course no one's bid on it um so you know on that end of it there's we've got some things up there for example people trying to sell some private issue patches uh csp collection that's uh from this little scout collector society and they want five thousand dollars for it and um this really bizarre things too um I think in another podcast, you all already told the story about the uh, World Jamboree patch that sold for $72,000. Right. Um, Certainly that would be the highest. But, you know, if you follow eBay, there have been several more um, Jamboree patches from that that year, 1947, that have sold for over $10,000. And so uh, that's been pretty amazing to watch because I think previous to that, you know, you really just hardly ever saw anything sell for over $10,000. There were, you know, just a handful of patches ever that had sold for that. 
Um, but it's amazing when you get two people bidding against each other and they have all the money in the world, uh, you never know where it's going to end up. So. Right. Uh, have you seen any uh, incredible fakes come out? Most of the time, the community takes care of itself, you know? Yeah, it's really it's really a shame now. And I think that um, I, I don't really see it getting any better, to be honest, because what you have is um, collectors bidding on these things because they know they're fakes, but they just, for the novelty of it, if someone fakes a patch from their lodge, for example, they want to have it in their collection. Um, I've seen that in my own lodge. People have faked some Santee Lodge patches, and some of my friends who are collectors, they bought them just, just to have them. And, you know, if no one would buy them, obviously there's no market. And uh, with the way patches are made now overseas, you can have them made very inexpensive. And so people, you know, literally go into a website like OA Images. They're taking the picture off the website and sending it to a patch company and having them make up a handful of them. And uh, people are paying a lot of money for these, and it's, it's, I don't see it ending anytime soon. Yeah, that's that's crazy. That is uh, that is a new thing I've seen. I was kind of surprised that people would pay a lot of money for those. The good thing about it is it's easy to tell that they're not an original item. I mean, it, they look like a fake. Uh, and you, you, you're right. Uh, some people do want them even just because it's of their lodge. But uh, I, I don't I don't have that bug. <laughs> <laughs> I, we talked a little bit earlier, a few tips for, like, new people to eBay, maybe some young scouts getting up and they want to post stuff on eBay. Do you have any advice as far as, like, you know, is it good to go with a low starting low starting bid price or is the buy it now something that's good or do the little add-ons like like adding bold or, or stuff like that? What are uh, what are some sort of, like, tried and true things that that are good sort of practices and tactics to make sure that, you know, your patch gets noticed and and it sells for some like what it would be worth. Sure, sure. Well, you know, <clears throat> eBay is a company, and so they, they've discovered every little way they can to make money off of your listing and you doing business on their website. Um, so certainly things like making your um, listing bold or having a gallery, you know, little thumbnail picture next to it, those are things that will get you noticed, but you have to weigh into it the fees that are going to be incurred. Um, as far as advice for new people or, or young guys on it, um, there's a couple of – one really simple thing is you have to realize that – in the Boy Scout category, there's over 10,000 items. And so I don't think there's anybody out there who spends all day long looking at all 10,000 items. What everybody does is they search according to certain keywords, whether it be OA flap or jamboree or whatever it is they're looking for. And so when you make a listing on your type in the title of the auction, it's very important to include keywords that people are going to look for. Uh, for example, if you're, you know, if I'm selling something that's OA, I'm always going to have the abbreviation OA in the title. I'm always going to put the word flap. Um, I'm always going to include the lodge number if I'm selling a lodge. Um, and, and, and don't use a lot of abbreviations if you can help it. You know, don't say Jambo instead of Jamboree because if someone was searching Jamboree, yours wouldn't turn up. Um, so that's, that's an easy thing. And then try to describe your patch as completely as possible. You know, down in the description where you can write in, you know, just whatever, as long as you want, a lot of people will type in a lot of extra information. They'll talk about where the camp is from and where the council is. And all those things are things that people might be searching for and would allow them to look at your auction. And that doesn't cost anything. It doesn't occur any fees from eBay. So um, as far as starting bids, you know, you can always try to to start out kind of high, and if it doesn't work, you can try and relist it with a lower minimum bid. Um, my theory is all I, I usually try to start really low, just because I like to see people, you know, get into the bidding mode and, and, and try to you know competition against each other. So a lot of my auctions will start less than five dollars just to get things going. Um, and of course, that way I sell some bargains, and every once in a while I get lucky and people bid against each other. But um, mm -hmm. you know. Just kind of dive in there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I think it seems like I've found, too, that usually if you start something low and people sort of jump on it and they're watching it, there's a lot better chance that it's going to go higher because there's more people interested in it as opposed to, like, if – I mean, if a patch truly was worth about $50 and you had a starting bid of 45 some people might look at that and like, oh, there's no way I'm going to get a bargain on that. And then they won't, won't even save it or look at it again. So I think maybe, I mean, like you said, every once in a while you probably will end up giving people really good deals. But I don't know. It seems like 
and, and it's probably just more fun that way too, just to have people sort of back and forth about it. But but it seems like usually if if a, a patch or a piece starts out low, then it gets a lot of attention, and and, and it seems like that that way works a little better. Yeah, and if you have, there's a lot of competition on there as well. You know, even let's just say you went to a, you know, your uh, conclave in Alabama, and, and you get home that weekend, and that Sunday you want to put some stuff up on eBay. Well, there's probably three or four other guys who are doing the same thing. So, uh, you know, you have to keep in mind your competition. So if you start all your auctions at 19.99, and the next guy starts it at 4.99. Well, you know, you just made a donation to the stockholders of eBay Corporation because um, <laughs> nobody's going to bid on yours when they bid on the other guys. So you have to right. let people have that opportunity to to get a bargain because that's really what people are looking for on eBay's bargain. What is is a patch in your collection that is one of your favorite patches, one of the ones that that you could probably never be talked into trading? And the second would be what's a patch that's not in your collection that really really needs to be in there? <laughs> um, well, that, that's an easy question actually. Uh, both of them are old uh, felt camp patches from the camp that I grew up going to. Um, you know, guys collect OA lodges and they collect different things, but uh, if you've ever had a camp that you worked at as a teenager and as a college student and you, you added up all the nights that you'd spent there and you figured out, my gosh, I spent over 365 nights. You know, I spent a year of my life at this Boy Scout camp. Um, wow. That's become a real connection. And so the camp that I grew up going to, uh, Camp Coker in a little town called Society Hill, South Carolina, the camp has been in operation continuously since 1929. And so my most prized patch is a 1936 Camp Coker patch. Um, at the time that I got it, there were only three known to be in collections. And I think now there's probably about six known to be in collections. Uh, just a really, really hard to get one. Um, and to, to follow up on it as far as what patch would I want in my collection would be the, the first Camp Coker patch, which there's only, I think, one I know of that's in a collection and another that is in a family, and they're not getting rid of it. So, uh, you know, no, no chances there, but I'll, I'll just, you know, be patient and maybe something will fall in my lap. Oh, cool. Well, thanks. That, those are, that's, it's nice to sort of see uh, each individual person's collection. It's sort of like a window into each person's collection, so mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Thank you. Well, we, we really appreciate it, and uh, and we'll we'll look forward to talking to you again on another Cloth Talk soon. Jason Spangler, of uh, uh, webmaster of uh, uh, patchblanket.com, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys, and good luck with your podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that archive of episode five. It's just one clip out of what was a longer episode of Cloth Talk. Again, my name is Jason Spangler, the Santee Swapper. I really appreciate you listening to today's podcast of Scouting Hot Finds Radio. This was episode 89. If you tune in, the next episode, episode 90, will be my long neglected interview with Doug Schwab, where we talk about the museum that was at the 2019 World Scout Jamboree. I hope you will listen to that. It's coming out pretty soon. And consider subscribing to my podcast and of course, giving it a five-star review. If you're willing to raise your hand and say, yes, I support this content, sign me up. As was mentioned earlier, please consider becoming one of the first people to join my Scouting Hot Finds Insider group on Patreon. Now that is at www.patreon.com forward slash scouting hot finds insiders. Again, Jason Spangler, the Santee Swapper. Thank you very much. <laughs>